So by way of a little bit of uh, history, um, when I first took office uh, in 2010, one of the first things that I wanted to do uh, was to bring together a group of uh, residents uh, that had an interest in the environment um, and we formed the Energy and Environmental Advisory Committee. And uh, we have a couple of members uh, that are here this evening. Uh, Sue Four, uh, if you would uh, raise your hand. Uh, Bob Knauer, uh, sitting right, uh, right back here. Phyllis Ely uh, from our town staff. And then in addition to that, uh, we have a number of other residents that have come together. One of the things that we really wanted to do was to talk about this whole issue of recycling and sustainability and, and what could the town do. And uh, so we've uh, run a number of programs. Uh, we've hosted a number of different activities. And uh, I think we've accomplished a lot in the last uh, three to three and a half years. Um, we started with uh, solar uh, about two years ago. We had a pump station, a sanitary sewer pump station, uh, just off on Creek Street. And uh, we put up solar panels. We powered that station, 100% of that station, and then a little bit more. And uh, that little bit more uh, comes back to us uh, as a credit to, to the town. And uh, we use that to offset the cost of our power, uh, of our uh, uh, charging stations for electric uh, vehicles. And there's one right outside this building. Uh, and then the first one that went in in the county uh, over at our community center. The next thing that we did is uh, that uh, we had so much success with that. Uh, Bob Knauer led us through that uh, process. Uh, Bob is an electrical engineer. Uh, Bob has been very active in our conservation board, now our planning board, uh, but really uh, has a vision uh, for looking for ways of uh, sustainability. And he helped us through the maze of NYSERDA paperwork uh, to help us get the funds uh, to put those um, programs together and very successful at essentially very little or no cost to the town. Uh, Jim Kreckman, our facilities foreman, um, it was his team uh, that uh, ran the wire and uh, assembled everything and uh, the actual uh, panels and a number of the units that, uh, that we got uh, were part of our NYSERDA package and some equipment uh, that was uh, donated. Uh, the, the second uh, project that we had was uh, one involving uh, Harris Whalen Shelter uh, over across from uh, Wegmans. And uh, we just installed some panels there. Uh, we estimate that that will take care of approximately one half of our electric needs for that facility on an annual basis. The other nice thing about that is it's right next to Harris Hill School. And uh, working with the school, we want to have a dashboard uh, for the technology group uh, at Harris Hill uh, so they can see what we've generated and what we've used um, as part of their technology program. So as the board and the committee uh, had uh, spoken, uh, the next thing that we wanted to take a look at, uh, is, there, is there an opportunity or an interest uh, for us to take it to that next step? And uh, so uh, we engaged uh, uh, some discussions with Larson Engineering, and I'll get to Matt Rankin in uh, just a moment. And uh, one of the things that uh, we spoke about with the committee is what can we do uh, to take this to the possible next step? And as a town board, I'm constantly uh, being asked by the board members, what is it that we can do to manage cost? Uh, so today, uh, we spend approximately $194,000 just on electric. Uh, that's our electric usage uh, in the town. So one of the things that we talked about is because we had the success with the sewer pump station, we had the success uh, also uh, with Harris Whalen, albeit uh, just online now uh, about a month and a half, two months. Uh, we wanted to have a discussion with the community and the neighbors of the uh, DPW facility uh, and talk a little bit about uh, the possibility of having a solar array system uh, at that particular location and for us to help take that uh, approximately $194,000, $5,000 and uh, significantly reduce that uh, so that uh, our, that's, that's not uh, being paid for by our uh, taxpayers. So as I mentioned, Matt Rankin is here with us. Uh, he is with Larson Engineering. Uh, Larson Engineering uh, has been around for a lot of years. Uh, back in the 70s, they were uh, the town engineer for Penfield. Um, uh, Matt's uh, boss, Rom, uh, went through a very successful career uh, near 40 years. And uh, then uh, he decided he was going to take a step back and have some fun. And uh, his fun is uh, getting involved with sustainability and looking for ways uh, to promote solar 
and uh, promote uh, sustainable uh, energy. Uh, Matt uh, is a part of that uh, part of that team, uh, an engineer that uh, is specializing in solar and uh, solar arrays. And I would like to uh, turn the microphone over to Matt uh, for the next uh, 10 minutes or so, 10, 15 minutes, and talk a little bit about uh, what we're proposing. And uh, then what we want to do uh, in the fashion of an information meeting, uh, answer any questions that uh, anyone has. So as Matt is coming up, I'd also uh, like to, to recognize a, a very special couple, uh, George and Kay Shaw. Uh, George and Kay Shaw uh, have been involved uh, with the community for many, many years. Uh, George is uh, currently our chairman of our Historic Preservation Board. Uh, George has a home, uh, George and Kay have a home here on the corner of Atlantic and uh, Jackson Road. Uh, one, of the, one of the homes that uh, has been in this community for many, many years. And uh, George and Kay decided an, a number of years ago, working with Bob, uh, to go uh, completely off the grid. And uh, George's uh, interest was uh, to cover all of his electric and at the end of the year get a check from our G&E. And uh, to his credit, uh, you know, George uh, certainly was a leader in that area. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce you to uh, Matt Rankin. And Matt is going to take us through a handful of slides and talk a little bit about um, uh, this whole solar concept and uh, where do we go from here. Matt. Great. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate everybody showing up to, to, to hear this. Um, a lot to talk about tonight, 10 to 15 minutes. I can certainly keep it to that. So again, my name is Matt Rankin. I work with Larson Engineers. Larson Engineers has been in Rochester since 1955. Uh, it's 59 years now. Rahm has actually been the president and CEO for 43 years. Pretty impressive, as Tony had said, uh, about five to 10 years ago. Uh, Rahm saw uh, the, a lot of opportunities opening up in this field of sustainable planning, sustainable development, uh, and co sustainable co sustainability consulting services. Um, so in addition to the core business, which is civil, structural, um, and environmental engineering. Ram, you know, started bringing us into the sustainability planning and energy consulting services industry. Um, we've done very well. We have a number of projects, solar projects specifically built uh, in neighboring municipalities. Um, we also have a, no a, no a number of green infrastructure projects that have been built uh, and quite a few more in the works. So, um, you know, that's a space that Larson Engineers has, has done well in, and you know Tony had invited us to, or invited me to come speak this evening to to the town of Penfield about opportunities that could exist in the town of Penfield for you, you folks to utilize solar energy. Um, so there's a few really important considerations when when looking at solar projects, and this is for anywhere between residential scale projects, commercial scale projects, all the way up to large scale municipal projects, and those are siting, um, where are you going to put the solar project? Uh, financing options, how are you going to finance the project, or who is going to finance the project, and lastly is grid interconnection. Grid interconnection is important because just because there's power lines running overhead does not necessarily mean that you can install a massive solar array and plug into that system. There are limits to the grid, um, and those are important to, be, to understand in the planning process for these types of projects. So what Larson Engineers uh, does for a lot of our clients is these consulting and planning services. So we go through each one of those work with our clients to educate them about each one of those three different things. Um, and then, uh, you know, the idea is that if they're, you know, they feel that a solar array would be consistent with their long-term goals for, for energy management, then, you know, they can move forward with the project. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was, so, the, f the first thing I wanted to talk about was the actual solar array project of interest for the town of Penfield. And then what I'm going to do is go directly into addressing some of the most commonly asked questions that we get. Um, I've been doing this for quite a while, although I am pretty young. And uh, you know, I, I love to address those very commonly asked questions because I get them at every meeting that I go to. Um, so first, like I said, let's talk about the site. Uh, the green rectangles, rectangles that you see in the middle of the, the, the image here, are, is actually a solar array that is approximately two to, to two and a half acres worth of, uh, of solar panels. I'll show you a little bit more what more. I'll show you in just a minute what, what solar panels would look like from uh, from the side view. Um, on the, the top side of that image is the DPW. 
That is the DPW facility. On the left side of the green solar panels there is uh, a debris storage area that is currently being used. There's a number of homes that surround. That's what the, the yellow parcels are the property lines for uh, a number of residential properties that surround this facility. Um, the, the space there is currently uh, an open grassy field and we had first started looking at a 500 kW array. And just for a sense of scale, 500 kW would offset about 55% of the total town's electricity consumption. Um, and that would be approximately 2,000 solar panels. Um, again, for a sense of scale, 2,000 solar panels uh, versus anywhere from 10 to 30 solar panels that would be on an average home. So it's a much larger project, but something that would yield much greater energy generation and potentially much greater savings. Um, so again, just recapping, the town of Penfield electric consumption history is about 1 million kilowatt hours per year. Um, the average blended electricity rate I'm showing is around 15 cents and change per kilowatt hour. I have an estimated cost of around 160,000. Tony had mentioned 100, 190,000. I'll have to find out what that discrepancy is there. Um, the DPW currently consumes about 99,000 kilowatt hours per year. Again, to put that into scale for you guys, an average home is going to consume maybe 7,000 kilowatt hours per year. So the DPW alone consumes 99,000. The town consumes about a million kilowatt hours per year. So we're talking very different uh, scales. The beauty of solar, though, is that it's a highly scalable technology. It can be applied anywhere from something as small as charging a cell phone. We see those technologies existing today. Uh, you can take them camping with you. They're affordable. They work. Um, all the way up to the solar projects that you see in the southwestern United States uh, consuming enormous portions of the desert. Um, that are huge uh, baseline power generation facilities. Um, we're kind of in the middle at this uh, kind of medium to large scale size. Uh, the town right now is currently looking at projects anywhere from 500 kW to 650 kW. Those numbers again are based on what the grid will currently allow us to connect to their system, their existing distribution system. And again, those, that range of projects would offset somewhere between approximately 55 and 73 percent of the total town's consumption. So that's kind of the, the basics of, of the project of interest here. Next, I want to, I'm sorry, uh, I wanted to show you a few pictures of some of the, the ground mounted solar arrays, what they would look like if a project were to be developed at this site in the town of Penfield. In the top left hand side is the Village of Lyons Wastewater Treatment Plant. That's about a 40 kW project. Um, but again, highly scalable. It would use the same type of, of structure. Uh, the, the front edge of the solar panel is about two feet off the ground. The highest edge is about six foot off the ground. Um, in the bottom right hand corner, you see the town of Williamson, which is a waste, uh, solar array to wastewater treatment plant. That's about 60 kW. Both of those are not too far away from here. I would encourage you guys to visit them to see what they look like um, from the ground level if you're interested. Um, this is again just an image kind of showing what the side view is. You can see about six foot on the trailing edge, two foot on the leading edge, uh, and they would be built in rows, all of them facing south in order to maximize production. Um, the next thing I wanted to do is just address the, some of the most commonly asked questions that we get. And this is just a very brief list of some of those commonly asked questions. So allow me to, to, to address those, and then we can get directly into questions and comments from the audience itself. So first is, and I get this all the time, does solar work here? Um, you know, the last few days have been moderately sunny, but as you guys know, this winter was rather cold, uh, rather cloudy, did not see the sun too much. Uh, in fact, the sun's only out for, you know, eight, 10 hours a day during the winter. It seems like uh, we get to work, sun's just coming up, we get home, the sun's just going down. Get the question a lot, does solar really work here in Rochester, New York, and more specific, or I'm sorry, in, in New York State, and more specifically Rochester, New York? The answer is yes, it does. Um, you see solar development across the country absolutely exploding right now, um, specifically in New York State. There's a lot of uh, residential solar development as well as large scale solar development in New York State. Um, it's really taken kind of the hockey stick shape uh, if you were to, to plot it on a graph. Um, the other thing to, that I should mention there is that Germany has approximately half the solar insulation value, which is basically just the amount of sun that actually hits the ground or solar energy that hits the ground. And they have uh, somewhere between 10 and 20% of their total grid is powered by solar. Here in New York State, it's a fraction of a percentage. So they have a lot less sun and significantly more development of the technology. So yes, solar does work here. 
Next is what incentives are available? Great question. Um, you know, projects can be expensive. What types of incentives are available? First, uh, Governor Cuomo is, is, uh, has, a, has a plan to make New York State one of the biggest solar states in the country. Right now we're, uh, I believe we're top 10 in terms of total installed capacity, but he wants us to be number one. Um, so what he, he, he started a few years ago was what's called the New York Sun Program. The New York Sun Program uh, was just currently funded again, uh, future, or I'm sorry, he funded it with nearly a billion dollars. It was $961 million to be exact to the New York Sun Program um, for the next 10 years. So a billion dollar commitment to install solar panels in the next 10 years. Now, the, the NYSERDA incentives, or New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, which is who runs the New York Sun program, um, those incentives typically cover 30% of the total project cost. So we're talking over $3 billion worth of, of solar projects, or solar panels to be installed in New York State. So it's a big investment that he's making, um, and one that you know, I hope that the town of Penfield can capitalize on, as have many others. Um, the next is solar project finance, or I say, how are, how are solar projects financed by municipalities? Municipalities are, are unique because they're not tax paying entities. So there's a number of, of mechanisms, or I'm sorry, incentives out there, such as tax credits and something that's called Macker's depreciation that a municipality would not be able to take advantage of. So what the industry started about 10 years ago, it's really taken off in the last few years, is what's called power purchase agreements. A power purchase agreement is a third party ownership model where you have a solar developer who actually comes in and builds the projects. So they finance, design, um, install, operate, and maintain the project. The benefit to the customer in this case is that the, benefit, the customer gets a reduced energy rate. So if you're paying 10 cents, in this case you're paying about 15 cents for electricity now, then uh, a solar power purchase agreement rate would be, say, between 8 and 10 cents a, a kilowatt hour somewhere in that range. So you'd see pretty significant energy savings um, you know, because of all the energy that would be produced from the solar array. Um, you'd be paying a, a reduced rate for that electricity. So that's the basis of a power purchase agreement. They're typically anywhere between 15 and 25 years in length. But what that enables you to do is to, to lock into a, an energy cost over that period of time. Um, as you guys know, in this past February and March, we saw electricity rates spike. Um, due to natural gas volatility in the, in, in the market. If, if you had a solar array, such as some of the folks do here, they weren't subject to those types of things. They were able to better control their energy costs through solar energy. Um, the other project finance mechanism is what's called customer finance. Um, or uh, in the case of a resident, they would pay cash for the project. In the case of a municipality, they would probably bond the project or pay, with, pay for the project via a bond, say a 20-year bond, 3% interest rate. At that point, you do not, you're not capable of taking advantage of the tax credits or the depreciation, but it can still yield uh, pretty high net present values or cumulative energy savings over, over the period or, or the life of the project, anywhere between 25 and 40 years. Um, the next thing is, how is the value of, of energy or solar energy captured? It's a great question. In New York State, uh, or say back in 1997, New York State enacted what's called net metering. Net metering basically just says how much solar energy was produced and how much energy did you consume. It takes the net of the two, and that's essentially what you are responsible for paying to your respective utility company. Um, a great mechanism. Not all states in the, in the country have that. Um, it, it places a high value on solar electricity, which, which encourages high return on investments. In 2012, the, the Governor Cuomo enacted uh, a policy called remote net metering. What remote net metering enables you to do is to, to install a single project in one location, a centralized location, and that would produce more power than what's being consumed at that location. So this is a perfect example where we have a solar array that's going to produce 550,000 kilowatt hours per year, ballpark, um, and the facility there only consumes about 100,000 kilowatt hours per year. So there's an excess of 450,000 kilowatt hours per year. Well, what happens to that? It goes into the grid, and your, the, the customer is credited at the per kilowatt hour rate on that meter, um, and that credit is, is a monetary credit and is then applied to all of the other electric billing accounts that the customer has. So it's a really creative program that enables customers to build projects in one location and allocate the solar energy generation to numerous other locations. 
Again, not all states have that. It's enabled a lot of solar growth in New York State. Um, are there interconnection constraints for system size? I briefly touched on this earlier. The short answer is yes, there are, um, especially for larger project sizes. Um, the size of the power lines, uh, simply speaking, uh, determines how big of a project could be installed on there. So that's an important consideration for large scale solar projects such as this. What are the health and safety impacts? Uh, another great question, we get this all the time. Um, you know, a, a few of the things that people ask about chemicals, noise, glare, electrocution risk. Uh, speaking to chemicals, there's very few chemicals. It's a solid state technology. It's based off of uh, a silicon, sand more or less, um, that is used to actually make the wafer, which is part of the solar panel as a whole. Um, so the solar panel consists primarily of silicon, um, glass, the glass surface, and then an aluminum frame. So from a chemical standpoint, uh, minimal, if any. Um, noise, the solar panels don't make noises themselves. The inverters, which converts DC power to AC power, may generate some noise, but it wouldn't be more than a hmm or, or a buzzing noise that would be uh, inaudible from 10 feet away. So if you're a neighbor at a neighboring property, you wouldn't hear the, the inverters making any noise, and they really don't make too much noise anyway. Glare, solar panels, remember solar panels are designed to maximize efficiency. Um, if there's glare, that means that sunlight is being bounced off the solar panel back into the atmosphere, thus you're not, it's not an optimal efficiency. So the glass is actually specially designed in order to transmit as much of the light as possible. Uh, the solar panels are also black, so there's very, very minimal glare. In fact, there's a number of projects being installed um, at, near, or on airports uh, across the country. San Diego is a big one. There's one going uh, up in Potsdam, I believe, at, at a, a nearby airport in Potsdam, Clarkson area. Um, there's another one going near an airport uh, in, in Oneida County, I think the city of Rome. Um, so there's very little risk for glare. Lastly, electrocution. Projects like this at this si size would be fenced with a chain link fence, typically six foot. Um, so there's, it minimizes the risk of somebody physically walking up to the solar array, um, even if they did. All of the electrical con or all of the, the wires themselves are, are in a conduit, very little risk of, of electrocution. End of life impacts. This is a great question. Nobody really has a great answer to it right now. Um, right now, if solar panels are being disposed of, they're typically being landfilled. There is no recycling infrastructure anywhere in the country right now. It's something that is currently being researched. There's a lot of R&D money going into that at, univers at the university level, um, trying to identify what do we do with the solar panels and then where do we do it? Where in New York State is the best place to build a facility to actually uh, properly dispose of the panels, whether it's dismantling um, or, or something like that. But again, most, for the most part, they're being either uh, disposed of in a landfill or they're being dismantled for scrap glass and aluminum, which has value. Um, again, end of life for a project, the, the solar panels are gonna be warrantied for 25 years. Uh, the racking is also going to be warranted for 25 years. So we estimate project lives to be between 30 and 40 years. The solar panels themselves have a performance uh, uh, degradation factor of about 0.5% per year, linear. So um, at the end of 25 years, they're going to be producing approximately 80% of their, their, their initial capacity. So again, project life, 25 to, to 40 years, anywhere in there. Lastly, what are other public sector entity, or what other public sector entities are taking advantage of solar in New York State? As Tony had mentioned, uh, Penfield has two, two active solar projects. Uh, the town of Lyons, like we had talked about earlier, their wastewater treatment facility. Uh, the village of Medina actually has three solar projects, not quite at this scale, um, but they do have three of the smaller solar projects. The town of Williamson has two solar projects, and there's one being built right now in their landfill that's a 1.5 megawatt project, or three times the size of what we're discussing here today. That project should be completed um, late fall of this year. The city of Rome is building a, a megawatt scale project on their landfill. Madison County is building a number of projects on their landfill. Um, and then just to, to talk about a few other educational facilities that are building large scale projects like we're talking about today, Skidmore, Potsdam, Clarkson, RIT locally, SUNY Cortland, uh, South Colony Central School District in Albany, Cornell, Tompkins County Community College. Um, so that's just an example of the number of schools and municipalities that are taking advantage of this large scale solar program that is available. Keep in mind, 
the reason we don't see a lot of the large scale projects uh, installed to date is because NASERTA didn't start funding the large scale projects until uh, about a year and a quarter ago, so not too long. Uh, project development uh, spans or, or lives for this, this scale of project is about a year. In fact, the first of the large scale projects are actually just being finished right now. Skidmore is going to be installed, or I'm sorry, commissioned, I believe this week, if not this week, next week. Um, so there's, again, there's a number of projects that are being developed and, and installed across the state that you guys can take a look at as examples of other municipalities that are taking advantage of this. So lastly, I wanted to open it up to, to questions from the audience itself. Are there any questions or comments? Yes. So, so if we could, if I could just add, sure. sorry, if we could, we got a microphone here. I've got the one I'll bring around. Uh, we tape our meetings. Uh, they're actually live, and then we tape them and rebroadcast them. And we always want to have the opportunity, if anyone wants to go back and uh, watch it, they have the ability to do that and to listen to the questions and things like that. So are you the... Yes. Okay. I recently read an article where they have solar panels now that work on light, not just direct solar rays. Right. Can you tell me something more about that? Sure, absolutely. So a solar panel is going to produce electricity anytime there's daylight. So right now, although it's very diffuse daylight, it's cloudy, it's late into the evening, a solar panel would still be producing power. Um, and to your point, performance of the panel itself is actually modeled, or I should say predicted, uh, based on data. It's about 40-year data, and it's regional specific. So every state has their own data, and then within every state, there's about 10 to 12 uh, regional points. There's one in Buffalo, Rochester, Messina, New York, Syracuse, Downstate, um, that have their own meteorological stations that use 40-year data. So what that 40-year data accounts for is one winter that's unusually cloudy, one winter that's unusually snowy. The snow does cover the solar panels and does decrease production. However, it does melt off within a few days typically. Um, so speaking over long periods of time, you can pretty accurately uh, predict the production from a solar panel. And to your point exactly, yes, diffuse radiation, which is what you would see out the window right now, will produce energy from a solar panel. Okay. Would you know of a company who would be interested in a purchase kind of arrangement? I would like to install some on my house. Sure. We can have that. We can, we can talk about that after the meeting. Okay. Yep. There's a number locally. Other questions? Other comments? Come right up here. Uh, I can bring this back to you. Whatever, whatever is easy. You're looking to get steps like I am, Charlie. So I know you, you want to get up there to that mic. Uh, you mentioned that this array, proposed array, produces a, uh, a great deal more electricity than the uh, town uses. Is nope. has it been investigated from RG&E whether, in fact, they can accept the extra? Uh, produced electricity? So to, cl to clarify, the total town consumption is about 1 million kilowatt hours per year. I don't have the production numbers, but a 500 kW array would produce about 550,000 kilowatt hours per year, which is only 55% of the total consumption. So the solar array, even the largest size that we're looking at, 650 kW, would only produce about 73% of the total consumption. So in no way would the project that we're discussing here today be producing more electricity than the town currently consumes. Did that answer your question? Or were you referring more to the grid itself, grid. capacity? Oh, absolutely. So we've talked to, to uh, RG&E, who works through NYSEG down in Binghamton um, with their electric transmission services division. And they have told us that there is sufficient three-phase service to this site um, that could support uh, at least 650 kW. So yes. Yes, hello. Uh, um, it's, uh, curiosity, is this, is this uh, basically a power generation unit or uh, as opposed um, to the, you have the town garage there, are they plugged directly into it or does all the power generated by these panels go up into the grid and then RG&E just credits back? And, and, yep. and part of that, uh, just to tail it on a little bit, if it is going to uh, um, the uh, uh, the town garage, or you know the town uh, uh, garage, or um, 
or if it could be, perhaps w with the when they improve the, the battery storage capacities, uh, yep. as they do it having vehicles and that maybe you know someday using an ambulance or something like that. I'm just just curiosity. Is all. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. So the Thank you. the proposed interconnection strategy for this project is actually going to be a new service, and by new service I mean. Uh, there's a power line on the east side of Jackson Road. That's where the three-phase line runs. Uh, just so you guys are aware, we, at this project size, we would be required to connect to a three-phase service. It's just electrical engineering lingo. Um, so what we'd actually be doing is, if you take a look at this image, it says point of interconnection, which is in the bottom right-hand corner. What would likely happen is a, a, a new three-phase underground service would go underneath Jackson Road all the way underground. Uh, to the other side of the road, at which point we would connect the solar array to that uh, via a transformer AC panel of some sort. So the details of that have, have not been worked out just yet, but there would be a new service and a new electric meter that would be installed at this site. The reason for that is because the DPW is currently served by a single phase service, at least that's what NYSEG and RGE are telling me right now, um, so that would be insufficient. So either way, we would need to upgrade that service to accept it. The, the more likely and more attractive, economically attractive alternative is going to be the new service. So, did that answer your question? Um, yeah, yes, and I, and I guess so, so the DPW can, can essentially, they can plug <coughs> into it and the excess goes to RG&E and, and, yeah. and, the, and the town can apply the credit to their other uh, other you, you, uh, operations going on. Sure, so let me so, expand real quick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Thank you. If there's a new service and a new meter, that means the only load on that new service or that new meter is going to be the parasitic load of the project itself. That just means the load of the, elect of the inverters at nighttime hours. They do consume a little bit of energy. That would be the parasitic load. So there would be a very small load which would quickly be offset during the day. Um, at which point just about all of the energy production from the solar project would be considered excess generation. Excess generation is then converted to a dollar value at the per kilowatt hour rate of that meter that we're talking about, which is then applied to all of the other billing accounts that the town of Penfield pays for. Did that clarify? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Remote net metering 101. Thank you. Matt, great presentation. Thank, Thank you for being here tonight. A couple of questions. Um, I've been looking to put solar panels in our house for a few years, and I just haven't been able to make the business case work. Mm -hmm. And one of our neighbors, who's a researcher at the U of R, just put $27,000 worth <laughs> of solar panels on his home. Yep. Now, first thing he told me is NYSERDA has to come and do a site survey to make sure you have the right siting. That incorrect for residential, okay. but I'll let you go. Okay. I'll clarify. So again, talking about the business case, I know there's New York State incentives, and you said it's about 30%. Are there, is there a federal contribution and in incentives to these fund? Uh, financing or funding these programs? Absolutely. As a percentage, could you just share, is it based on scale or? Sure, so this is this is leaning towards the residential discussion, which I'm going to keep to a very brief here for the purpose well, of this discussion. How about if the town does it? I mean, I would prefer um, to do that. The one thing I would say is that within the last year, uh, so the cost of solar has come down uh, probably 30, 30 percent or so uh, in the last year alone. In the last two years, probably more than that. The photovoltaics, you mean? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. So if you have, haven't, haven't talked to somebody in a year or more, I would definitely talk to them again because the business case could be different, which is why the town is now considering solar at a larger scale. Next okay. question. Okay. Well, wasn't a good answer, but how about this? Um, read a lot about siting on churches and schools. You know, there's valuable real estate, yep. and a lot of times, again, you know, it, it may be more advantageous to put them up higher, vandalism, again, angle of the sun. I sure. mean, is that an opportunity instead of using valuable real estate? You said two and a half acres for, you know, 550K. <clears throat> is that an opportunity? Is there any cost savings there? Uh, no. There is an opportunity. We looked at a number of the different facilities. The challenge with roofs is that roofs um, re require maintenance, they require replacement. Um, a solar array could very likely outlast a roof. Um, so we wouldn't want to be in a scenario where you put a project on a roof today and you need to replace it 10 years from now. Okay. Um, so but the so ground mount is the way to go in, in most cases. In fact, m most of the solar projects that are being built today are ground mounted projects at this scale. Okay. There's, there's other benefits from an economic standpoint and it's more related to the metering aspect of it. Um, this, the DPW building has a demand charge on the bill. A solar array will not affect demand charge. 
thus you've uh, reduced the economic attractiveness of a project um, by doing it that way. It's different for residential. Okay. So the cost of electricity is variable. We acknowledged that earlier. And I did a calculation of mine. I pay a little over 18 cents per kilowatt yep. residential. And that's going to go up and down. And you yep. know, you can only imagine in the future it's going to get more expensive. When you look at the business case, do you plug sure. in yep. those type of factors uh, to yep. help justify these kind of projects? Absolutely. So we look at 23-year data from um, the uh, United States Energy Information Administration, or the EIA. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Uh, which Great is website, New by the way. New York State-specific um, electric industry generation-specific data um, that looks at the cost of electricity over uh, ab about 23 years. It's about 3% annual escalation rate. Um, in the last, since 2000, it's more like 3.5%. And in the last 10 years or so, it's actually more like uh, three and a half to four percent. So it's actually increasing at a slightly greater rate now. Conservatively, in all of our models, we we estimate typically three percent or three point five percent when we do our production modeling. Okay, thank you. Last question, just on storage. I mean, again, given it's a variable power, and uh, you know, the tech, there's no breakthrough <clears throat> technology yet on storing, you know, electricity from the sun. And yep. But I happen to know that Chan Philbrick's uh, son-in-law works at Ideal Power, which is, I think, one of the preeminent companies right now in research of battery systems and storage systems. I mean, where do you see that on the horizon? Is that something that will be an option? Again, instead of selling it back to RG&E, you know, imagine that you have a difficult scenario and it would be good to have the power available to the town made by the, or harvested in the town. Sure. So, so storage is, is a great question. Uh, it, it's something that's being looked into. As you had mentioned, there's a lot of R&D money. Uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, up at Eastman uh, Business Park, the New York Best uh, battery production facility, testing facility just opened up. There's a lot of uh, companies that are interested in coming to the Rochester area to help develop the technology. Um, at this stage, it's just not ready for market deployment at the scale we're talking about right now. It's being, in California, it's starting at utility scale. Uh, so we're talking, you know, huge batteries the size of this room plus. Um, and then you're looking at small residential scale. Those batteries also work. But in between, it just doesn't work yet. So the beauty of, dis uh, of distributed storage, though, is that it can be added later. So five years from now or ten years from now, when it may make more sense, you could add it to the project in order to increase your, your benefit. So it could be added. Yep. And I think the, uh, the, only, uh, the only piece of that uh, last question or, or two questions before was with regards to uh, what, what do you get back from the federal government oh. by way of incentives? Oh, so for uh, a for-profit entity, there's the 30% federal tax credit, and then there's what's called MACRS depreciation, um, which is modified accelerated cost recovery uh, system, I believe. Uh, depreciation. It's a modified accelerated depreciation schedule. Five years versus, I think, 25 years or something like that. Um, so those are the two incentives available for, for large commercial scale projects like this. For residential, uh, I have to brush up. Uh, Bob may be able to, to, to assist me here. I believe the 30% federal tax credit, and I think there's also a state tax credit. It was once worth 25%. Up to $5, it's still 25% up to $5,000 for residential. versus the contribution of electricity back into the grid funds it? I guess I'm not sure what you mean by break even. We, we usually think of it more as return on investment in this business. Okay, I just think in terms of capital outlay to, yep. to buy something like this. Yep. And then you have some kind of cash stream to pay, pay it off over time. Right. I mean, is there a, is there a, you know, a five year horizon, 10 year horizon? It, that's a, a very complicated question. It all depends on how the town wants to actually finance the project. Um, and we can certainly have that discussion with the town on which is the best mechanism or vehicle for finance. So, typical ROI for, for a, a project where you can utilize tax incentives three to five years max. Okay, thank you. Let me address the one question he actually said first when I said it does not apply to residential. Uh, in fact, um, one question that we had talked about uh, with, with the board and with Tony himself was if NYSEG comes forth and says you guys can only install 650 kW worth of solar at this site and the town in fact installs 650 kW worth of solar at this site, does that limit 
nearby neighbors or anybody on that distribution circuit to install solar? And the answer to that question, which I confirmed with the New York State Public Service Commission, as well as NYSEG and rg &E, is no, it does not. In fact, uh, the utility company cannot deny a residential solar application because of what's called the Boxler limit. It's a, uh, what they use to calculate circuit capacity. Um, again, the utility company cannot deny a residential solar application uh, because of the box of the limit does not apply to residential solar projects. Thus, anybody in the surrounding community could install a solar project um, without having to pay for any types of grid upgrades. They could not be denied by the grid. Yes? This is probably, you sort of touched on it, but when I saw the original um, display with two feet off the ground, it occurred to me that it would be very easy for a deer to jump <laughs> onto the display, and I was wondering, you mentioned about the six-foot fence, so yep. probably that answers that, but suppose we had a hailstorm, like the softball size sure. hail coming down. Yep. What, what Are these panels warranted? Do they get replaced by the manufacturer? What happens if there's damage? Yeah, they're warranted, and depending on the manufacturer, they'll have an actual, uh, part of the warranty will help to cover that type of damage. Depends on the size of the hail. I'm sorry, the warranty um, depends on the size of the hail that's actually coming down. Um, but believe it or not, the panels are tilted at about 30 degrees, which is going to reduce the moment of impact, force of the moment of impact. Um, but also, the, they're pretty sturdy. Um, I, would, I would say they're stronger than the glass on your car because there's more layers to it. There's more support behind it. So it's very unlikely that they would break from, from hail. They're, they're, Sure, sure, but uh, with a six-foot fence, yes, they may be able to scale a six-foot fence, but it was very unlikely that they would be able to, to damage a solar array or a panel. Good question, though. Any other questions? No? While we're waiting, while, while folks are, are waiting and thinking, um, a question that uh, came back uh, here, so I'll address it uh, now. I was yep. going to address it uh, as we got uh, near the end. And that is, uh, what happens after tonight? Uh, so uh, the intent of the board uh, tonight uh, was to reach out all, to all of the neighbors uh, that might be directly impacted, and then also make uh, all the residents in the town via our website and press release uh, to let them know what we're uh, proposing. Um, if, if in fact, uh, there are no major issues and concerns, certainly the next step that uh, the board will be taking a look at and working with Larsing is, um, and, and uh, our facilities folks is, is that, you know, uh, what, what is that going to be size-wise, 500, 600, 650? Um, that uh, would be reviewed uh, by the board. We also want to take a look at the financial component. And so is that something that we do ourselves uh, via a bond? Is that something we do via a purchase uh, power agreement? And uh, we'll have to run those numbers. But we didn't want to get ahead of ourselves uh, with that until such time as uh, we at least had a public information meeting and give uh, our residents an opportunity to uh, ask questions, speak out uh, for or against. And then uh, what we'll typically do is uh, we'll wait for several uh, weeks uh, for any other comments uh, to come in and uh, give those an opportunity to kind of, uh, you know, trickle in and uh, an opportunity to answer uh, some of those questions back. And we would typically do that uh, so we would post it on the website. We'd get the question, we post it on the website with the answer so that everyone uh, saw the question and saw the answer to that uh, particular question. So, um, and then uh, it, it is the town board that would make the final uh, decision uh, on this. And again, we would do that uh, not in a vacuum, but uh, with input uh, by a lot, of, uh, a lot of individuals, our residents, uh, our experts, the engineers, our facilities people, and, uh, and uh, our uh, controller. Absolutely. I'm sorry. I just have one suggestion for sure. as far as the neighbors go. Maybe think about running a two-foot berm around the six-foot fence and putting up some um, um, some kind of vegetation just to keep it um, looking. You know, whatever. That's about it. Okay. 
So, so that's a good, good point uh, that uh, where, the, where the green is, is the solar array to the left of that or to the west of that is um, uh, where we store a lot of material. One of the things that uh, our highway department is looking to do is to uh, start to clean up that material and uh, make that a little bit more attractive. When that pile started, there were no homes in the area. And uh, so the thing we want to do is uh, we want to uh, be good neighbors as well. So. That'll be another area or an opportunity to maybe lose some of that uh, material. Okay. Other questions, other comments? I'm going to offer up uh, Matt. Uh, we still have a few more items on our agenda, but I'm going to offer up Matt uh, uh, out in the rotunda so that if anyone would like to speak to him in any, any detail about this project or solar in general, I'm sure he would be willing to uh, help answer any questions. I just want to say I'm delighted that the town goes in for a solar project, and I hope it succeeds, and I hope you do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.